So that's what I lived with, that edge of knowing I have to find work for someone and mm -hmm. I have to fill this job for the institutional customer. Otherwise, I don't get paid. Right, exactly. Yeah, that edge. I think that's the thing that you definitely have. It's just, it's that edge. But I think you have to infuse um, something in your coaching that motivates people to act because again if you're just delivering words to people and i have to say you know in my experience as a career coach um motivating people is extremely important when you're giving them this advice because they have to step outside of their comfort zone and i'll say there's a a difference between motivation and inspiration yeah so So our guest this week is Jeff Altman, AKA the big game hunter. Jeff is a career coach, leadership coach, and executive coach. He helps companies hire talent and helps his clients find work. Jeff has more than 40 years of recruiting experience, assisting individuals improving their careers. If you need help becoming the leader you want to be, you need help with career transitions, or in your role as an executive, he is your man. He is also the man. <laughs> he, has, <laughs> he has the number one job search podcast, No BS Job Search Advice Radio on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> I'm feeling fabulous. How are you doing, DJ? I'm doing great and even better now that I'm talking to you. It just you oh. have this energy to just, I mean, it just it just infuses, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I need I need to, I'm 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 I have that, but I want to I want to get more of it. <laughs> well, I'm here to give you the voodoo. Okay, I will take the voodoo. Yes, you know all I can get. So. 40 years of career coaching and I've, you know, I'm a career coach and, and I've been um, doing it for, for about 10 years, but uh, most of it has been, you know, helping people with resumes and so forth. But in the last two years, I began more taking it more seriously. I wrote a book and, but it's nothing com comparable to the experiences that you've had over the years and what drove you to be a career coach. Well, I want to clarify one thing, and that is okay. I spent 40 years being a recruiter. Mm. So I help people find work. I listened to my clients tell me what they wanted. My job was to give it to them. And so I heard all the complaints. I heard all the criticism. I heard all the whining and moaning about one person or another. So I listened to that for 40 years. I had a great career. But, you know, after a while... It's hard to be in the middle of everyone lying to you because <laughs> your clients are lying and the job hunters are lying and mm -hmm. you're the messenger of the lies and you're being blamed. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. bizarre, but that's what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. So along the way, uh, I was planning on being a therapist in private practice wow. and I met my wife in graduate school. And uh, in doing that, it became, okay, I've got a well-paying career. She's going to stay home with the kid. And we're going to have a house, the kid and the what have you. And someone's got to pay the bills. Right. And that became me. So I hung out for a while uh, longer, like another 19 years uh, before transitioning into coaching. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've, I've built off of all my experiences. So obviously I help people find work and career transition. But I also have an MSW from Fordham University in New York. Wow. I did postgraduate psychoanalytic training at the Institute of Modern Psychoanalysis in New York. And I've also led men's retreats for organizations where I've had responsibility for attendees and staff and helping cultivate leadership in individuals in mm -hmm. the course of those weekends and beyond. And I'll just simply say, as a coach, I bring all of this into play. I bring mm -hmm. you know, that knowledge and experience about what it takes to be a successful leader how to be effective with a job search, hire more effectively, mm -hmm. and um, you know, be much better in the workplace in general. So it's this is a culmination for me uh, of all the experiences and trainings that I've had. 
Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure your experiences as a recruiter has made you even, um, I think that experience in itself makes you even more well-rounded career coach because you have that perspective. Yeah, it's real world experience, not something mm -hmm. that someone read in a book or took a course. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the classic uh, issues that students have, for example, upon graduation is they hear from career services people what to do. And those people have theoretical knowledge. They right. never had the responsibility of finding a job for someone. They tell right. people what they've read and what they've mm -hmm. learned, but mm -hmm. when your income is on the line. Yeah. It's a, you got to earn a fee and you have to help someone get to where they want to get to. That's uh -huh. a very different perspective. So that's what I lived with that edge of knowing I have to find work for someone and mm -hmm. I have to fill this job for the institutional customer. Otherwise, I don't get paid. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that edge. I think that's the thing that you definitely have. It's just, it's that edge. And of course, I mean, you have all those wonderful experiences, but I think you have to infuse um, something in your coaching that motivates people to act. Because again, if you're just delivering words to people, and I have to say, you know, in my experience as a career coach, um, motivating people is extremely important when you're giving them this advice because they have to step outside of their comfort zone. And I'll, I'll say there's a, a difference between motivation and inspiration. Yeah. So motivation, the difference? motivation is lighting a fire underneath someone. Mm -hmm. Inspiration is lighting a fire within someone. Mm. And from a hiring perspective, it's important to know the difference because, you know, and again, I know hiring managers don't think in this way, but the statistics are that 18 months after a person is hired, the hiring manager has buyer's remorse almost mm. two thirds of the time. Wow. Incredible statistic. Almost two thirds of the time they regret having hired this person. Wow. So, the result winds up being, is it any wonder that people hate their jobs? Mm -hmm. So how do you sit? find someone who, because um, I've sitting on, I sat on interviews and, you know, I'm there writing my notes down and, you know, I give my, my analysis of what I thought was the best candidate to the hiring manager and they may go with someone very different mm -hmm. and, what are the signs that now I always say I, I know the signs because I know the questions, I know the answers, I know BS answers, <laughs> no BS job search advice radio. I know the BS answers, but when recruiters or hiring managers are interviewing someone, what are the signs that let them know this is a good candidate versus someone that is going to be a part of that, that percentage that are going to not be a bad hire? So I have to start off by saying, you have to understand the dynamic of an interview. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic of an interview is that job hunters are always on good behavior. Mm -hmm. No one ever talks about the bad review, the time they were yelled at, the mistakes that they made. No one ever does that. They mm -hmm. put on a good show. That's their job. Right. The hard thing to remember is, the employer, the hiring manager is doing the same thing. So it's a setup to believe that either person can really assess mm -hmm. because they're both putting on an act for one another. Mm -hmm. Remember you know, how rare it is that a hiring manager has ever said to a job hunter, you know, DJ, I've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the last four people who sat in that chair would ask you to sit in. Mm -hmm. They've all left. They left within four months. And, you know, we've got problems on this project. Mm -hmm. And my predecessor got fired. And so did hers. I need to hire someone to save my bacon. <laughs> right. No one ever says that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. all the time, but there are problems. And they never mm -hmm. really talk about the problem. So it's a setup for failure. Mm -hmm. What I tell employers to do in my coaching is to say, identify the issues for the job hunter 
because surprises are never good. Mm -hmm. Employers instead, most of the time, they put on the happy smile button face. Yeah, oh, that's very we've true. We've got a terrific opportunity <laughs> with a great team of people. Right. I mentioned we're like family around here. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the families in the holiday movies that are throwing things at one another. <laughs> but not family like we think about it. Right. And even worse, we want to hire a fast track individual who could make change around here. And then they mm -hmm. put roadblocks in their way mm -hmm. to do the things that they said on the interview they wanted them to do. There's mm -hmm. institutional friction that gets in the way. And the hiring manager shrugs their shoulder and goes, I don't know. I'm doing the best I can. I can't change everything around here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and thus, there's a con that goes on. And from the, from the employer's perspective, I always encourage them, tell job hunters the truth about what they're stepping into. Yeah. Because otherwise, we're living in an age where they can tell people who will tell people, who will go online and tell people. And you're, you're going to hurt yourself this way. Right. Conversely, I tell job hunters, be clear about what it is that you're looking for. Right. Yeah, even with um, employers, I'll start off by saying, you know, make the point of telling them what the problems are, what they're going to be stepping into, what the issues were for the predecessor. And if the person doesn't want to step into that, that's okay. You were right. going to lose them anyway. Yeah, exactly. You're going to save a lot of uh, recruiting money, you know, that way. You know, so I, I totally agree with that. And another thing that I've discovered is that when, you know, to say to someone who has actually been interviewed, going to an interview and they done their homework, they know this is a, a great opportunity. And when they're answering those questions, I always say to, to my clients, you know, they already know what um, what your qualifications are. They have your resume. At this particular point, while you're sitting in the interview, you need to um, tell your story, tell them why you are the best candidate, tell them what, how can you solve problems? Because really they're hiring you to do, to do just that, solve problems, solve their problems. Like you were saying earlier, you know, they, they have someone breathing down their neck. So they want someone that can make that less <laughs> less of a, a hot breath on their neck <laughs> so so how can that in a, that person um really make themselves shine in an interview where they may be very very competitive and they may feel as though that they want to shine brighter than the next guy who may actually have some a better resume so Here's the dirty little secret of job hunting. Mm -hmm. That job description or that ad that you saw, maybe it's 80% accurate. Mm. Maybe. And HR people laugh when I say that. They say, and they follow up by laughing and going, if we're lucky, it's 80%. And you have to understand how these job descriptions are generated. Mm -hmm. It's Friday afternoon. DJ has walked into someone's office and said, can I see you for a minute? They immediately know you're quitting. Mm -hmm. At which point it's three o'clock. They've tried to persuade you to stay or wished you well, one or the other. And now they call over to HR and they go, hi, do you got that job description we used to hire DJ? And he just gave notice. So could you get it out to, to your vendor resources, put it up on the website, you know, mm -hmm. Do your magic with it and see who you can get onto my calendar on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one updates them. I'm very sorry. Oh, that's okay. No one ever updates these things. Mm -hmm. And thus, often people are aiming at the wrong target. Okay. So even before the interview starts, you have to you know, begin the conversation by saying, hey, thanks so much for making time to meet with me. You know, I recall the position description, but I want to get your take on the role. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about the job as you see it and what I can do to help? Mm. So this way you get the current thinking about the job at the beginning of the interview. 
-hmm. instead of at the end where most people hear about it and it's too late to do anything with the information. Mm -hmm. So by asking that question right away, it's a consultative sales process. Mm. If you think how we're sold these days, no one walks in with a briefcase, opens it up and says, oh, let me just show you all the products I can sell to you. <laughs> no, they don't. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. But that's what people do on interviews. Mm -hmm. They think they know what's being looked for and they don't. So the first thing you have to do right away is mm -hmm. get clear about the job. Okay. And then from there, the next part is once they say, so tell me about yourself and what you've been doing professionally or walk me through your background, please. You have to pretty quickly connect the dots for them mm -hmm. between what it is they just told you they're looking for mm -hmm. and what you've done. Okay. No one wants to hear you bask in your own magnificence for five minutes. Right. Talking right. about everything you've done in your life. You're going to put them to sleep. Mm -hmm. And no one has an attention span longer than a minute to a minute and a half. So mm -hmm. if you start droning on about everything that you did when Barack Obama was president, <laughs> or worse, for older workers, the Clinton years, you know, you get those people uh, who, who start, let me tell you what I did when Abe Lincoln was president. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Who's right. going to sit there as you walk through a graduated college? Yeah, that's so boring. I try to tell, you know, clients all the time. That's, you know, they, uh, I mean, they have to be there. They're not, they're, they're not having this interview with you just because it makes them giggle. <laughs> they're there because they have to be. And I always say, you know, what makes it to me a great interview is being able to show that. I'm a person who you want to work with. I'm a person that is a good listener. I can, uh, I am coachable. I am a good person that once you give me direction, then I can make things happen. That's the the energy that you want to bring to the interview, not just regurgitating all the things they already have read in the uh, resume, if they even read the resume, you know? So I, so so I like I what a, you're saying. I did a LinkedIn poll about uh, for, for job hunters, about preparedness for interviews mm -hmm. by hiring managers. Two thirds of respondents said, doesn't seem like they were ready for me. They were mm. completely unprepared. Wow. So you have to engage them. That's your responsibility right. as the job hunter. Mm -hmm. I talk in, in my coaching about the theater of interviewing. You're a performer on the stage. Now, I don't mean you're a liar. I want to be clear about this. Right. Your job is to engage your audience mm -hmm. in much the same way as when you watch a TV show, you've got a remote control in your hand or right near you. And if you're not interested, how long does it take before you click away? They're the same way on interviews. Mentally, mm -hmm. they start channel surfing. Mm -hmm. and, and thus, they're sitting there and they're nodding at times that they think are appropriate. But you may notice them first of all, yawn, and they cover their mouth regularly. Or, mm -hmm. And you see the, the, the cheeks puff out because they're yawning. Come on, folks. You're an entertainer. You're right. a performer. You yes. have to keep them interested because yes. all the other people who they're interviewing with are reciting facts. Right. And they're boring and disinterested. Yes. This and it's not interested. And I think that that being this, you know, in, in this COVID environment, we'll talk about about, you know, how COVID has really changed the interviewing process. You know, a lot a lot more interviews are being held during Zoom or or some other virtual platform. And what I try to tell people is, hey, you know, this isn't you know, you and your family getting together on Saturday and having a family reunion on Zoom. <laughs> Are you with your, you know, your your group of, of, of people that you're, you know, I'm, I'm a part of different networking groups and, and you know, some people are, are, you know, sitting back in their couch and people have their phones and all you can see is their neck and their chin. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, even though this is a Zoom meeting, 
you still have to prepare and treat it just like you was going to that particular person's office. Yes. And folks, you know, if you're watching DJ, notice how he presents on camera. Mm -hmm. He's wearing something that allows himself to pop. Mm. So he's front and center, looks great. That's what you want to do. You want to present yourself as world class. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's a hard phrase for most people. Oh, I'm not world class. Oh, no. You want to be the best version of yourself. You want to mm -hmm. look good on camera. That right, the best version makeup. of yourself. If that requires makeup, you put on makeup regardless of gender. You know, mm. Wear the makeup to hide yeah, that and a little bit of rouge. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is. You create the impression of the environment. You dress a particular way right. in order to be world class or to give that impression. Mm -hmm. Because trust me, folks, employers notice when you aren't. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to activate the negativity. If anything, neutrality is the best negativity is not so minimally go for okay like, mm -hmm. you know, my, my office here you know i'm wearing something that stands out against the backdrop i'm mm -hmm, wearing mm -hmm. my my coach cap which is part mm -hmm. of my branding mm -hmm. um, you know if i were meeting with uh, a potential client Sometimes I wear this depending upon whether or not they've seen me on YouTube wearing it. Mm -hmm. Other times I don't. Depends on the circumstances. But I want to create a visual that looks good. Right. And from there, I'm normally there before they are. Mm. I don't want them waiting for me. I want to be the one who's waiting. And mm -hmm. I keep my edge up so I'm ready right away. I want to ask the first question, like I did before, well, folks, rewind and listen to that question again, because that's where I want to start before they ask anything. Mm -hmm. And it's easier if you're there first and ready to roll. And, and they say, hey, great to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Hey, before we get started, I just want to ask a quick question. Sure, whatever. And then you ask that question and suddenly you have the roadmap for what the interview is all about. Mm -hmm, exactly. And thus you can be prepared. So folks, be world-class. Don't be an amateur. Right, right. You know, show up the way you would show up. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, you know, some people still, I think, need to have a little class on how they even show up to an office. But if you're going to show up to the office the right way, don't let down that guard just because it's a Zoom meeting or a, uh, you know, Cisco X, whatever that. Uh, WebEx. Uh, WebEx. WebEx. You know, because yeah. I had a meeting like that one time, you know. And, um, you know, it's. I think you just have to be conscious of the situation. Who's interviewing you? And I still do my homework. I try to find out what are the people there on that team wearing? What do they wear to work? You know, where is my supervisor? Where is he going to work? I try to get an idea of that so that he knows that I'm going to fit in into that environment. So I don't want to outdress anyone, but I don't want to unaddress either. I want to have a good idea to let them know that I'm going to fit in. So do, could you give me some are uh, some pointers about about that? Because I do listen to people. So I got one example. So one time I was going to an interview some years ago and um, I knew that these people were, were they were, the, the job was in a warehouse and it was for the government. I was uh, doing consulting for the government financial, but they all just um, pretty much um, delivered um, IT equipment to different agencies within this government agency. And I knew what was to be the point with, of dressing um, in a suit, no one does. Everyone there wears pretty much what I'm wearing now is what what everyone pretty much wear. And I began to get myself ready and I, I saw a relative that was visiting and she said, you're wearing that to the interview? And I'm like, yeah, I'm wearing this to the interview because you know this is what everyone wears at this location, everyone, regardless of who you are. And she just thought it was the wrong mistake that was a big mistake and i felt like you know this is you know makes good sense so i went to the interview and uh 
I, you know, of course, they, they saw me and, and I just fit in because I was wearing what everyone else there wore. And um, pretty much I could tell that his mind was made up um, at by the time the interview ended. Uh, they were literally showing where I was going to sit. So I do think that sometimes you do have to just be conscious of the environment that you're going to be in if you're lucky enough to go and see and or wait outside and look at the people going into the building to get an idea of how do they dress, um, how do they present themselves. And it, I think that does help sometimes. It does. One of my favorite stories along these lines was a hedge fund that I used to recruit for. I got very close to the person who ran technology for them. And before the first interview, uh, he told me, we don't like to see people wearing ties. Mm. Now, when your association is with a hedge fund, you're thinking of fast track, fast paced, great wardrobe, at least you did back in those days. And he was very clear, we make fun of those people. We think of ties as being things that catch food and for no other purpose. So tell them not to wear a tie. Mm. Do you think I, I told them? <laughs> <laughs> and for you folks, understand what you're walking into. Right. Because whether, you know, in some cases, I'll tell someone to wear what you're wearing now and a sport jacket on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because it looks a little bit more professional. Yes. It depends on the circumstance. And mm -hmm. I think of that in the context of when we get to the negotiating phase, it affects the money. Oh, yes. Yes. So looking the part or slightly better, not radically yes. better. Yes, slightly better. Yes. Allows you to stand out in a good way and advantages you when it gets time to the money. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And so, I, I read somewhere some statistics saying that people, you know, who wear a, a sports jacket um, or a, um, a dress uh, coat. Uh, get better service, you know, and when they're at a restaurant or they're in a situation where they're asking for customer service and also they get paid better. They get paid more the ones who, um, you know, wear suits. <laughs> I mean, that's obvious, but it just seems to me that I can definitely see that um, showing up to work, even if it may not be, um, you know, some jobs they actually told me, you know, in certain positions, do not show up in a tie, just don't do it, you know. Um, and there are other jobs where it was necessary. But and then there was other jobs optional, if you could wear if you know, it was it was optional to wear a tie or a suit. But those individuals who would a tie or a suit anyway, they progress faster, I noticed, you know, they didn't have a really issue with sort of getting into those circles with people who were higher up, who actually did have to wear a suit to work, <laughs> even though it was telling people- And that's an East didn't. Coast thing. On the West Coast, it's completely different. In what way? Well, on the West Coast, it's a much more casual environment. Okay. Even the leadership roles. And thus, like if you've ever seen pictures of, we've, we've all seen the pictures of Mark Zuckerberg. You know, mm -hmm. Ever see a suit on this guy? Like, no, not, I have not. I think maybe, I think the first time I saw him, he was actually um, testifying in front of Congress. I remember the hoodie days. Where he, <laughs> would, he would go to the investors wearing a hoodie. And, and when he went to Congress, yes, he wore a suit that day. But beyond that, he's always mm -hmm. casually attired. Yeah. You know, uh, Sergey Brin you know, from Google. Uh, um, you know. Bezos, you know, Jeff Bezos is, is I, I, I cannot, when have I seen him wear a suit? I just, I can't remember off the top of my head, but lately, no, definitely not. And we never see him live, we, except when, you know, he returned uh, on, from the space voyage. You never see him live, you see photos. So he's always, you know, prepped for that photo opportunity. Mm -hmm, right. Uh, so just recognize folks that your job is to be persuasive and yes. to make them believe that they should choose you. And it's not just what you say that matters, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. And competence is only one thing that they evaluate for. Yeah. Self-confidence, 
character. Some firms want to hire people who are a character. Some people want to hire people who, who actually have character, have character or both. <laughs> you know, so self uh, competence, self confidence, character, chemistry, like you get, seem to get along with the people that I like you on first blush. Maybe a little charisma because charismatic people will always do better than non charismatics. Yeah, that's very true. They want to trust you. So how about if for those individuals, this is something that I hear from people a lot. They say that um, I'm not good at interviewing because I'm not a, a person who is good at just talking. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a talker. And though you could, you know, we see those people or we know those individuals who can go to an interview and they're just good talkers and they can just, you know, they might be the best workers, but they are a good, they can, they can definitely talk a good game. So how would a person who may they're not BS people? Yeah, they're, yeah, well, I didn't want to say it, but I let you. <laughs> they are the BS people, you know. And and you know, some people do. I, I've heard a lot of complaints about, you know, he gets those positions because he's, uh, you know, a good talker or a good BSer, and 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 yeah, that's true. So how can those individuals shine equally? are greater in an interview when they're maybe not be the best talkers or the best BSers um, in situations like that? So I, I have to break it into two parts okay. because there are people who are legitimately introverted mm -hmm. and they will never be that ebullient big personality. Right. So I'm gonna to come to them second. I'm just talking about the shy person or the one who's critical of the other and start off by saying, learn to do it differently. Mm. Don't make an excuse for your behavior. You're not allowing them to see you at your best. Mm -hmm. And that's what the whole game plan is to see the best version of you in front of them. Mm -hmm. So that they know, like trust and respect you. And if you're inhibited, you're never going to let them see that. Yeah. And that's on you. That's not on them. Mm -hmm. So you got to change the dynamic and open up and trust and practice doing more, being clearer, practice your answers to predictable interview questions so mm -hmm. that in this way, you know, they get to see you and understand what your capabilities are. Mm hmm. So that's for that person. For introverts, the kind of job that you're going to be best at is not the same type of job that that person's going to be best at. Mm -hmm. And thus, you're probably going to be more analytical or quantitative in some way. Mm -hmm. And that person is, shall we say, a showman or a showwoman. Mm -hmm. And thus, they're performers. And they're always going to put on a good show, and you're not for that audience. Mm -hmm. For your audience, you're going to stand up beautifully in answering questions that relate to what you do and how you go about doing it, and, mm -hmm. and, and what your thought process is. Anyone who's asking about your thought process, you're, you're ideal for, mm -hmm. because you know how to describe that. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Don't sweat those jobs. You don't belong. Yeah, I like the the concept of your thought process because that you know I'm I'm naturally an introvert, and people sometimes get a little bit like they 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 don't know me very well. They they are surprised about that, but I always say I'm a a, a introvert. Sometimes posing as an extrovert, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so I know when it's time to shine. I know when it's time to kick up the volume, you know, and in the interview process, I'm definitely going to kick up the volume because that's the time to do it. If you got any, is any time to kick up the volume is doing an interview. And so, um, so yeah, I definitely understand that, that you do have to, I always say to clients, your job in the interview is to make a friend. If you have made a, if you feel as though you've made a friend in that interview, I feel like you've done your job in that interview. 
So that's what the goal to me is when I'm there in the interview. I'm trying to show you who I am as a human being because I am a good person. And so why would I not want to show that to that particular person that I'm a good person? I'm afraid of being rejected is the answer. Mm. And thus, what happens is by not giving them something to like, you wind up being rejected. Mm. Exactly. So it's a, it's a bind. No matter what you do, you have it set up to fail and can blame them. Mm. But the truth is, like I said before, it's on you. Because in, on an interview, and there are a lot of interview type situations where you're being evaluated, but particularly on a job interview, you have to risk everything. True. You got to put it on, on the line because if they don't like it, great. You're not going to be trapped in a job that you hate. Yes. You're not going to have to be phony on the job because you fooled them with the act. Instead, by being that best version of you, they see who you are. They like or don't like, which to me is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. You'll be rejected for the right reason. I don't like her. You know, I don't think she'd fit in. or I don't think he'd fit in. That's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I tell people all the time when they are feel as though I'm giving them advice. Maybe uh, I know one guy he hated, uh, you know, putting a, he, he was totally against putting a picture on his LinkedIn profile. Just like, no, I don't want you to do that. Um, and uh, so I was like, you know, one thing that, you know, most people have a picture on their LinkedIn profile. And sometimes I feel like if you do not, then I feel like you may be showing yourself that, you know, showing the cards that you're antisocial, you know, and um, or you may have some self-esteem issues. So and that was the case, you know, as we begin to to con um, continue um, meeting. So that was a um, a barrier that I felt that you need to get over because employers see that like, okay, you don't have a, a picture up and this is an environment where most people do have a picture up. What's going on here? What's up with this particular person? And I'll, I'll answer the question. You know, ageism is a factor. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't want them to see I'm as old as I am or as overweight as I am, mm -hmm. uh, or I'm hiding my race from people because they're bigots mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I get it. But when you walk in the door, they're going to find out. <laughs> right, so, exactly. So I was saying you're going to find out anyway. And why would you want to work? Why would you want to work? This is what I said to him. Why would you want to work for someone who thinks like that? Why do you want to be in an environment, especially if this is the hiring manager? Why Save would you yourself want? the time. Yes. Because you're going to have to do an interview and you'll get on camera or go there in person and they'll discover, oh, he's a fat woman. Oh, she's yes. a, he's a fat guy, whatever it mm. is. Right. And you're out the door anyway. Why did you put yourself in the position in of, of wasting all that mental energy? Yeah. Yeah, it's like save your gas money, save your dry cleaning, <laughs> you know, and, and don't even go to something like that. If you feel as though these people have these types of hangups or this environment is a, a toxic environment. Ooh, you know, I, I always, want, go ahead. I always love the word toxic environment. Like people cop to toxic environments pretty quickly mm. and they put the blame on the environment for the rejection. Mm -hmm. When often it's their own lack of preparedness. Now, don't get me wrong; there are toxic places. Yeah, I know. If something's about butts about it, and you can find out about a lot of them by going online, and you yeah. talk to people who are former employees, or you see what gets posted on places like Glassdoor. And folks, if you use Glassdoor or any other review site like that, eliminate the, the extremes. This place is awful. <laughs> the best place I've ever worked. But you know, the, the two extremes aren't helpful. It's the stuff in the middle that you mm -hmm. pay attention to. Yes. Give you some texture. Yes. But, yes. And I've, I've had been in interviews and 
and I've been lucky enough where people will show me around, just sort of walk around the office, and I'll walk into the person's um, office. When, well, back in the day when we actually had, you know, sit down face to face interviews. Ooh, what was it like in the old days, Grandma? <laughs> <laughs> and just walk into the person's office, I could hear a pin drop. No, and this is a office full of people, and no one's talking. Everyone has their heads down, and I'm going, "What's going on here?" You know, and of course me, I, I want to find out <laughs> now I know better now, but um, I went through those situations where I took those jobs and found out why nobody was talking to you. You could hear a pin drop and everyone had their head down because it was trying to block from being shot at. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, in a sense, you know, because it was just it was such a, a an environment where people were constantly being um, belittled, you know, so it was just the nature. So here this new guy showing up and they go, oh, boy, here we got a new got fresh meat. <laughs> Someone else to make fun of. Oh, we can criticize him. He doesn't know our tactics yet. Right. You know, it's and, and know other people who were, were, you know, victimized as well. I mean, it was just an environment where I, I knew people who spirit was just broken in that environment, you know. Yeah. And uh so when they see a new person showing up, they're going, they don't want to tell you anything. They don't want to say anything. They don't want to look at you because they feel like if they even look at you they're going to reveal something about you know this place and they don't want to get trapped into this person said this is a negative thing about this place so um and then once i you know of course had I resigned because i said i don't want to be in a toxic environment i don't want to be in a place where my spirit's going to be broken and then people wanted to be honest and say this is all the things that are going on which i knew by the time i left but people felt more open and, and feel more able to be honest about how they felt about their environment, not willing to leave, but will stay and put up with that. Which goes back to a point I made earlier. Everyone's lying on interviews. Mm -hmm. Job hunters lie. Employers lie. Mm -hmm. Everyone presents the best face. And thus, you have to look for cues along the way to help you flush out the BS give you something to investigate. Again, you talk to former employees, find them on LinkedIn. It's not that mm -hmm. hard. No, Google them, find out people who worked at this company before. Now, if you're talking about a major government agency with 100,000 people or a major corporation with a population like that, it's tough to get to the department, but you mm -hmm. can network your way there. Yeah, you definitely can. You can definitely, I think LinkedIn is a good tool to, to ask questions because even if um it's not they're not in the same division it's still someone knows something about that division it's like yeah i heard i've heard about that place <laughs> i've heard about that place that place you don't want to go to you know you probably want to ask a few others as well but um but i've i've had those conversations with people and and just through conversations they go you don't want to go there you know and then you hear it again from other individuals. So just through conversating, asking people about different places, um, they can give you insight to the environment that's there. You betcha. You know, years ago, I had a friend of mine who was up for a job at a, at a mutual fund. And I said, you know, he didn't really have a large LinkedIn network. So I told him, yeah, go Google the firm and the word resume. Hmm. I, th I think at that time, the way you had to do it was company name in quotes, I think it's in parentheses now, plus resume, minus um, apply or minus, it was designed to avoid the you know, job descriptions so you could get to a real person. Mm. And he found someone who had left the job, uh, a specific job six months before, talking them about the hiring manager before the interview. So he was able to hear all the headaches and he comes back to me and goes, I'm not thinking that one. Mm. Do a practice interview. I'm okay with that. And just don't go to work there. Just practice because you haven't done an interview yeah. uh, in, in two presidencies. 
So go, go interview. Make your mistakes here because you don't care. Exactly. I think that's the best advice when it comes to interviewing is because, you know, no one's, I don't say no one is, but, you know, no one wants to be a professional interviewer, you know, if it's an interviewee. You know, nobody wants to, you know, you want to have a job on the what first, second, third interview. So you never get to, you should never feel like you're a professional interviewee. So you're going to have some, some rough, uh, that first or second interview are going to be kind of rough for you. So if there's an opportunity to take, to interview on a job that you know, you don't want, at least you're getting that, that practice for that job that you do want. So I definitely agree with that. Yes. And there's sites like I'm affiliated with one site uh, that does mock interviews in a variety mm -hmm. of fields. So, mm -hmm. folks, if by some chance you're interested, the biggamehunter.us forward slash mock takes you to a site where they've got a free version, but in the premium version, I personally critique what your answers are. They're recorded on video. So I have a chance to look at them afterwards and make suggestions for you. Do mock interviews. You know, Mm -hmm. Whether it's with me or someone else, yes. or some other service, do mock interviews so you make your mistakes in advance and you don't make them there. Yeah, and I'll leave that link in the show descriptions as well um, to that to that link you just mentioned. Thank you. Um, so people can go there and because and, and, I definitely believe in mock interviews, you know, to to is, you know, offer that to clients, because to me, then especially those Zoom interviews are, are really good because I can say, hey, you look pretty just dead in the face. You know, I wouldn't say it that way, maybe dead in the face, but I would just say you need to you need to to liven up. I mean, nobody wants to hire someone that is just uh lifeless <laughs> and i know there's not the intent that the, we want to come off that way as aloof but just because of just our face you know i'm, I'm not a, a male model i don't <laughs> you know so i you know you do have to smile and show some interest even though you are interested and you want the job but make sure that that's coming across to the person that you're speaking to and sometimes we do can can look very serious especially on a camera if you just not if you're not photogenical you know if you you know you, you come across as aloof even though you're not that's the way you read and that is what pretty much goes down as you know the the feel of or what you're providing or what you're giving i always tell people in my coaching you know when firms are hiring they want to see some life in you yeah so you don't have to sit like the village idiot with a smile on your face the mm -hmm. entire time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, I love everything. <laughs> I love, 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 love. But at times, a smile and a twinkle in the eye projects self-confidence. Yes. And, and what they want to do is trust you more than anything. Yes. And thus, if you appear self-confident, they have more belief in you versus a flat affect that gives them reason to only view you objectively. Can she or he do this job? Well, yeah, but so can this person and that mm -hmm. person. How do I choose between them? Mm -hmm. Do I like you? Am I going to like you? Yeah. And will mm -hmm. they make me look good? Mm -hmm. That's another benchmark. So if, if you're not giving them the impression that you'll help them look good, and you're going to be aloof to use your word, then you know it's harder to get hired because you're not yeah. giving them something to like. Yeah. But if you smile, the twinkle in your eyes, mm -hmm. you know, it just and, and speaking with your hands, never blocking your face, but speaking with your hands has a lot of power to it. Yeah. It conveys certainty and um, conviction, and yeah. that they buy into. Yes, yeah, so true. I, I definitely believe that that, you know, moving your hands are, you know, just showing some level of, of expression. I think it it definitely brings ease into a room because the truth is nobody wants to to hire. I wouldn't want to hire anybody that I'm not going to get along with. I, 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 I have to go tell this person to do something. <laughs> and 
if I feel like this person is not the person that I'm going to, is going to be easily to get them to, to do what it is that I want them to do, or I feel like they're going to do a bad job of it, then that's not the person that I want. I want the person who I know I can go to and I'm going to feel comfortable saying, I need to get this done and to get this done now. They, go. they yeah. want to hire their version of a winner. Yeah. Yeah. So and anything true. that you do that interferes with that thought makes them think and turns you into a loser. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yes. But, and, 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 you know, when it comes to, you know, coming across as a winter, a winner, you have to have some feeling that you are within your being, <laughs> you know, you have to feel like you're a winner to come across as a winner, unless you're just one of those, you know, as we said earlier, one of those BS people who can just get through an interview and talk through an interview. But I feel as though that's kind of miserable in a way, because, you know, what kind of level of fulfillment do you actually get? You're not really, you know, I think applying, you know, yourself, you're just getting through something. So I don't now people they give people those comp it actually is a compliment when someone says that they are they can just talk through any situation but on the other hand what kind of fulfillment does that bring a person when you just you're not really applying your talents unless that's what the job requires you're just a person who does a bunch of talking or some pr position but at some point you gotta actually do the work <laughs> that they're asking you to do. So, um, so I always say, you know, don't get caught up in that and in those individuals that you know can easily BS a situation because they have their own battle that they gotta deal with. You know, so it's you no know, no one's gonna get off <laughs> in this, you know, without a challenge. So true. It, job hunting is like dating. Mm, yeah and, and you know you can get through a first date and you may get through a second date <laughs> but yet, with time the truth get, comes out everyone yeah. starts lowering their guard just a little bit i'll use the interview term you're going back for a final and suddenly you know you're going to meet the big boss the dad <laughs> in the story <laughs> i'm doing like yeah, 1950s shop. american television <laughs> Yeah, you're going to meet dad and dad is going to give you a over and over. Uh, and at the end of the day, you want to go to work at a place that will treat you fairly, that you like the work, yeah. to be compensated well. You're working with people that you'll enjoy. And if you put on an act and you know they're putting on one too, mm -hmm. you know, you got no shot. Yeah. So yeah. you got to be the one to risk opening up. And yeah. not calm people. Right. It's a dead end. You know, I've seen it so many times where people have uh that they are good talkers. They just, you know, they they can get people pull people in. And then when it's time to do the work, you know, it, they're miserable because they are good at the talking. You know, they're not good at the actual getting in the, the nooks and crannies and actually getting the work done. So, you know, and that's miserable. So that I see them always changing the job, trying to find something new because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not fulfilling for them, you know? So I, I pity that. I'm like, why envy something like that when it's not really truly fulfilling when you're actually just, you know, getting by. And you're not getting by folks, but it's not very long. <laughs> eventually you and they figure it out and thus, you're dead-ended, doomed, pushed aside. The work goes to other people. You're trapped and you go into the circle of got to find another job. Mm -hmm. And you stop blaming it on them. It's really about you. Yeah. It's all, it, and that's one thing I always say. It's all about you. You know, it's all about you. So you really have to look at things from that perspective. So what will be some, some I would say, maybe five you know, because one thing I, I definitely think about in this COVID time, which is kind of interesting as well, because, you know, I was saying, I know we, we talked before and I was saying, you know, how people are sort of had it difficult to to find jobs within COVID, during this COVID um, epidemic, um, pandemic. But then we also have an issue where people are not wanting to 
find jobs. They're, they're like, I'm, I'm fine at home clicking this unemployment. So, so, so I don't, so the, I guess the, the, I won't say pity, but I'm just saying, I guess the feeling that I had is, you know, what about those individuals who will find it so difficult to find jobs? And then this other piece of it is that, you know, people are people really looking for jobs, <laughs> you know? So I do feel like, okay, well, who is it that really needs the help? And I think that the people who really need the help, I think are suffering the most are those individuals who are just fresh out of college and they're, they're looking for opportunities and, um, you know, it's already difficult trying to leave college and, and find a job, but this COVID has made it more immensely difficult when you're trying to build a resume and job history where it, it's not as easy because um, they're looking for qualified people, but maybe those qualified people aren't maybe looking either. So maybe, I don't know, it just to me, I find it an interesting conundrum that I wasn't expecting. Well, it's interesting um, that, you know, as we're recording this, we're going through a period that's referred to as the Great Resignation. Mm. So lots of people are changing jobs. And the last job report, and the previous one as well, almost a million new people were hired into the workforce. Now, at least 40% of them were in hospitality mm. or in services industries that were relatively low wage, which was to be expected because all the restaurants and hotels shut down. Mm -hmm. So they now have to hire up. And that's really where the biggest issue is in those fields because people make more money staying home. Mm. Now, back to white collar labor for a second, where they're in a situation where they could be a little fearful about changing jobs right now. I'll just simply say, firms are trying to hire. There's shortages of talent. No one entered the workforce last year to speak of. And thus, there are opportunities if you're working and you have skills to find another job. Don't hesitate. There's opportunity out there. And if you need coaching, DJ does a great job. I do a great job. Yes. We'll guide you through the process and help you perform at a high level. And we'll even help you with the decision about which firms to join, which firms to eliminate from consideration so that you minimize the risk of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. and that's where we're starting up. Risk of, uh, of avoidance or risk minimalization rather than putting yourself at risk. So mm -hmm. there are jobs out there, but the skills needed to find a job are different than those needed to do a job. And that's where coaching comes in. Yeah. We help you perform better throughout the entire life cycle of the search. You write resumes. I don't. I critique them. Mm -hmm. Because of my background in search, I hated writing resumes. <laughs> but I could look at a resume and make a decision in four seconds. Mm. The typical number is six. I had it cut by a third. I could do it in four seconds because... I'm a visible figure, and that's how we get bombarded with resumes that were pointless, like the Purdue chicken plucker who applied for the Java development job, and the word Java never appeared in the resume. Wow, yeah. So you go on and on, and folks, I'll just simply say you're an amateur. Mm. Work with professionals so that you get the results that you want faster. Because otherwise you lose out on opportunities that you'd otherwise get. And you don't want to learn through trial and error. It's yeah. painful to do that. Yeah. Coaching makes all the difference in the world because we know how the system works. So true. Every, every advice I need to definitely just write down every single word that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> because everything you said was just so, so true. I mean, down to the core, you know, and that's the thing that I find that's so amazing about talking with you is that it's not about this superficial concept of um, what it means. Because a coach, to me, every coach that I've met, I don't care if you're a life coach or a career coach, 
um, a, a holistic coach is all is about those principles, those underlining principles that I believe you definitely understand that you have to understand. I think that any um, at the basis of any great career coach, success coach, whatever coach you are, if you're a good one and you are, you have those basic life coach principles at your core. And that's what's so intriguing about what you're you're saying to me. It's those underlining concepts, those underlining ideas that you hit on that I think is so valuable. What was it like there? Just start having career conversations with people who are further along on their road than you. Reach out to them through LinkedIn or other places. Mm -hmm. So this way you start making connections because whether it's for the internship or the job you get after graduation, mm -hmm. do that. Um, faculty, of course. You know, if you've been a standout student, ask the faculty for recommendations. Mm -hmm. They know. They're, they're usually adjuncts and thus they've got a full-time gig that they're working at and they're teaching on the side or vice versa, they mm -hmm. can provide introductions. Yeah, yeah. Just don't hide behind a screen. Have mm -hmm. conversations with people. You may need to start on screen. I got it. But don't hide. Start talking to people and practice what you're going to say in advance. Like at jobsearchtv.com, which is my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, and I, it's also on Amazon and Roku and a variety of other places. Um, what you're able to do is to go to a playlist around informational interviews, and there's things there that you can learn about what you might ask. And learn from there or at my website, thebiggamehunter.us. Learn questions that you'd ask that would allow you to learn more about the profession. Mm -hmm. and understand on their side, they're afraid that you're, you're going to ask them for a job. So make it clear, I'm not going to ask you for a job, although if you offer me one, I wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. I really just want to get your advice about stuff mm -hmm. so I can learn from you and your experiences and not do trial and error. Yes. Most people will be very gracious at that point. Yes, yes. yes. And the fun thing is to say, I'm not going to ask you for a job, although if you offer me one, I, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll take it. But if, you know, and that's the thing, I mean, opportunities show up in different ways. I mean, just in volunteership. I mean, if a church, I mean, if it's, you know, if it fits what you're trying to obtain at some level, then sometimes your local church is a great place to, to, to look for a place where you, it may not be a, a, a total internship, but just volunteering. That's something that that's genuine experience you can put on your resume. If Absolutely. That, that, Absolutely. That Do things that make yourself visible so that in this way, you're not a well-kept secret. That you're someone that they want to talk to. Hold on. I think that's my phone ringing. And where is it? Uh, I put this on. Uh, I put this on. Do not disturb. But so I don't know why is it ringing. But sorry about that. Life happens. So how do uh, the, my listeners or the listener at my, my listeners, how do my listeners get a hold of you if they want to ask you more questions or reach out to you about uh, career coaching, executive coaching, or leadership coaching? My website is thebiggamehunter.us. You can schedule time for a free discovery call or schedule time for coaching. I'd love to help you. Also mention... I do a show now as a LinkedIn Live. It shows up on YouTube and mm -hmm. Facebook as well, uh, where if you just have a question for me, send it to me at thebiggamehunter at gmail.com. In the subject line, put the phrase office hours, because I call the show Career Coach Office Hours. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, I do it now Tuesday at noon Eastern and Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Unless you send me the questions in advance or put them in the chat while I'm doing the show live and I'll try and respond. So yes, those now, are always the easiest ways. And I'll leave that in the, the show descriptions as well. 
um, to those uh, to your LinkedIn page. And also, if uh, you would send me those links, I'll be sure to include them as well um, in the show description. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. I really enjoy having you on. You are uh, a mentor. I consider you to be a mentor of mine um, because I've learned so much from you in just the year that I've known you. So um, I definitely appreciate uh, me being able to come to you and say, hey, you know, what's going on with this? <laughs> I'm having a problem with this because, you know, and I think that just reaching out to you, um, you're one of the first people that I reached out to and, and you were one of the first people who who uh, responded and say, yeah, no problem. Come on, I will have you on the show. Yeah. So, um, and I'm so, LG in podcasting. You know, my show, um, from a podcast perspective, number one in Apple Podcasts. By the time this records, I'll have had more than, uh, I'm sorry, it's released more than 2,200 episodes. Wow. Over more than 10 years. And the YouTube channel, by that time, I'll have over 7,000 videos. Wow. That's amazing to me. I mean, that's what I was trying to get there, you know, slowly but surely. But that's, um, that's what I aspire to, because to me, that's that level of consistency, that level of drive is just to me is just amazing. I think it's just awesome. You know, so when I look at your I think I'm I, I to be honest, like I model like certain parts of my business off of yours because I'm just so impressed with what you've created. And, and I, I just I was just so amazed because I, when I started researching you before I reached out to you, you had like three different websites and you was on LinkedIn and you was on YouTube. I'm like, this guy's all over the place. I'm LinkedIn member 7653, by the way, <laughs> of the almost 750 million people on the platform. Wow. And yeah. so that's, I said, well, I gotta, I gotta step up my game. I gotta, you know, I gotta have a YouTube. Gotta, it was just, it just amazing. You no, know, it, it, the amount of engagement and impact that you've created and i know it's not isn't i know it's not effortless but you make it seem effortless thank you that is the intention i've got eight books and guides to job hunting on amazon i've got the podcast the youtube channel i'm on amazon and roku uh the podcast that just came out on helium radio as a seven wow. day a week show at 8 a.m uh eastern time you know folks i know you need help it's here it's, it's there here yes and to me that's the thing that that i will leave i want to reiterate that you said you don't have to do it through trial and error you could have someone to literally guide and walk you through to get to meet your goals without bumping your head now if you like hitting your head against the wall <laughs> knock yourself out but to know that's what that, will happen you'll knock yourself out <laughs> but it, it's not necessary it's not necessary for you to bump your head and go through a trial and error process you have people here who can guide you through so that's what's so amazing about coaching and i wish i would have known you years ago i could have saved myself from a lot of trial and error but because i have the experience i can help others um, with those trials and errors that I've had, but certainly um, if I had the opportunity to go back and have someone to say, hey, this is a better way of doing it, it would have been so awesome to have. Well, you got me now. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, <laughs> you know, that's what I wanted to hear. So, and thank you for being on the show. Um, and it's always great speaking with you. You always bring me this extra boost of energy. And um, I need to call you my caffeine. Because <laughs> <laughs> you always give me this, this boost of energy and it's so great talking to you. And um, so I, I definitely will be back in contact with you. I want to be have you back on the show and um, and still be in contact with you through the process, because I just think that you're just an awesome person. Thank you again. And you're welcome. Yes.